Their defense is a joke. What it really comes down to is I would love to have either of them. They don't have a, a prayer in their secondary. They have nothing. So you're saying just don't draft Blunt? I'm saying don't draft Blunt. He was unbelievably efficient last year. You know that they use their running backs in the passing game a ton. I'm drafting him tonight. That's Team Huevos. Huevos <laughs> <laughs> Gigantes. <laughs> Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I am your host. I'm joined today by Mike Taglier, and you can find and follow both of us on Twitter at KyleYNFL and at Mike Taglier NFL. Tags, I wanted to ask you a really important question, man, right at the beginning of the show here today. Mm-hmm. Just how bad is the new LA Rams logo? <laughs> it's it's pretty horrendous, man. Uh, I, I was trying to figure out the best way to just like explain how I felt about it, and it looks like it was created for a basketball team in 1995 when graphic design started getting more pixels added into their monitors. That's the best way I could describe it, and I can say this with 100% certainty that my 17 year old daughter could have made that logo on her iPad right now, and in reality it probably would have looked better because she knows the difference in shape between a basketball and a football. And then, (laughs) that's not even the end of it, the Ram head, like if you look at not just the LA logo, but the Ram head, it looks like the generic version. If you, you know, like when you, your, your wife goes to the store and you're like, Hey, could you pick up some like, like Kraft mac and cheese or something like that? You tell like something specific. And then she comes back with like a great value brand. This logo looks like a generic logo. <laughs> I think Rams fans should be upset with with, with the entire thing. It, it's terrible. Man, well, someone pointed out on Twitter that the it looks like the LA logo with like a comb over, and I just can't I can't <laughs> unsee good. that now. I just can't unsee it. So that is so good. It is good. It's, yes, it's just what I see every time that I look at it. Well, hey, we're not here to talk just about the Rams logo. We're here to take a look at free agency, and we've got an awesome guest here to do that with us. That's Derek Brown of Fantasy Data, and you can find him on Twitter at dbro underscore ffb. Derek, thanks for jumping on with us, man. Excited to uh, talk some football with you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. This is gonna be a blast. Uh, yeah. Uh, just real quickly, uh, I do share the uh, the Rams logo hate. The I can't unsee a mullet. I just I can't unsee it. There, there's no yeah. way I can stare at that and not see business in the front and party in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that should I think be there. Say that nothing is good with the Rams logo. Can we all agree that anything you associate with it mm-hmm. is all bad, right? Yeah, Absolutely. that should be the that should be the tagline of the entire team. L.A. Rams business in the front, party in the back, something like that. You know. Oh, and also bad. Um, and also, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A team yeah, that's we'll, rebuilding with a with a you know hundred million dollar quarterback. Right. We'll uh, we'll I'm sure we'll get into that, uh, <laughs> no doubt. But hey, guys, uh, today we have free agency winners and losers. We're going to be taking a look at the key moves so far and giving our analysis on the fantasy football impact of those. Uh, with so many players shuffling around, players see their fantasy football stock rise and fall. So we want to take a closer look and talk through some of these players. Before we get into that, though, I want to remind you all about this contest we've got going on. Right now, thanks to Pristine Auction, we're giving away a signed Marquise Brown Ravens helmet. All you have to do is go to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher and leave a review. Then take a screenshot of that review and email it to contest at fantasypros.com. It's that easy. Make sure to do this soon, though. The deadline to enter is approaching quickly on March 31st at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. And for more details, head over to fantasypros.com slash contest. Again, a huge thank you to Pristine Auction for making that possible. And I want to make sure that we thank them for sponsoring today's podcast. Their daily auctions have hundreds of signed and memorabilia items to choose from that are perfect for your man cave. I was taking a look at some recent items that went, and these were simply too awesome to not share. A Jamal Adams signed jersey went for only $44. And a Jared Cook signed Saints Speed mini helmet went for only $36. Pristine Auction is the place to go to get your signed authentic memorabilia of your favorite players at unbelievably affordable prices. It's quick and free to register, so head over to pristineauction.com. That's P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E auction.com. And when registering, enter in Fantasy Pros. All one word in the registration code field to receive a $5 credit for your first order. Again, that's pristineauction.com to start building your dream man cave today. All right, guys, so a lot happened over free agency, right? So let's just start up at the top here with the DeAndre Hopkins and David Johnson trade. So what is the fantasy football impact of this move, and who did we see improve their stock, and who's took a bit of a hit? I'll go to Derek first here, and then I'll send it over to Tags. 
So I, I think it, we definitely have to look at DeAndre Hopkins as this being a hit for him in a, many different ways. I mean, you look at a guy last year, he was second in target share behind only Michael Thomas. And for me, there's a lot of hype and a lot of love in the Twitter streets for DeAndre Hopkins right now, and rightfully so. The guy is a beast. But we can't look at this and say that he's going to get 150-so targets, that he's going to definitively just have this number one role on lockdown. I mean, the guy has seen 150 more targets in every year since 2014, and for me, if you believe that, like, considering his ADP and all the hype that he's going to garner because this offense is going to be improved, that unless you're looking at this offense being quicker than it was last year because it they slowed down a lot after week three, they were 24th in plays per game over the last part of, like, basically the entire season, unless you think that there's a lot of touchdown equity that he gains from this or that they speed up, I'd look at it, it's going to be something that's going to ding his value, and I'm probably not going to have a lot of exposure considering where his ADP is going to fall. But I love it for David Johnson. The volume is going to be there, that he's going to get the touches. Now we can question what they're going to do as far as pass game role and how they're going to use him and stuff of that nature. But you don't make this move for the guy unless you're going to use him. And if he's got any juice left, which everybody wants to declare that the guy is absolutely dead, I'm not willing to do that just yet. Like, I think David Johnson's got at least a good year left in him. If they can find a way to sit here and keep Carlos Hyde healthy last year, I think that it's possible they can do the same with David Johnson. And we've seen Watson just pull a rabbit out of his hat a million different times. So this offense is going to be at least passable and decent. And the touchdown equity and what's involved for David Johnson, I think that, if anything, his value was left for dead if he stayed in Arizona. So it's a boon for him going to Houston now. Yeah, I mean, for me, the whole DeAndre Hopkins thing, initially when the move happened, Yates and I talked about it almost immediately after it happened. Like we talked about it on the podcast. I think it was like, you know, you know, 14 hours after it happened. And Yates was saying that he moved DeAndre Hopkins down quite a bit. And I ended up writing a profile on Hopkins and and what it meant for him. And the reason I can't move Hopkins down too far in my rankings is because Hopkins is produced throughout the entirety of his career. And yes, he has seen 150 targets, I think in each of the last five or six seasons, but at the same time, he's done it with ridiculously bad quarterbacks. Like, you know, Deshaun Watson is the best quarterback that he's ever played with, but oddly enough, Hopkins averaged more fantasy points per game with the other quarterbacks, even on a per target basis so it's not like efficiency or anything like that he has just produced with no matter who his quarterback is going to Arizona we saw Kyler Murray in his first year there even playing a little dinged up throw 542 times last year Deshaun Watson didn't throw 500 pass attempts so if we're going to increase Kyler Murray's uh you know, output in terms of like, look at last year, what he had Kyler Murray. He had Christian Kirk dinged up for most of the year. He had Larry Fitzgerald, who's going on like 50 years old. He had David Johnson, who was beat up. He's thrown a Damier Bird and uh, Damier Bird and, uh, uh, Keyshawn Keyshawn Johnson, Johnson. a a Mm -hmm. rookie because Hakeem Butler's out. Andy Isabella is not on the field and they still threw the ball 542 times. The good thing about Hopkins going to Arizona is that This team's defense is still not in a very good place. They're not going to be a very good defense. Fortunately, they're starting to add a few people uh, throughout free agency, which will allow them to run a few more plays because their defense should be able to get off the field, especially if Byron Murphy grows a little bit in year two alongside Patrick Peterson. So I'm not so worried about DeAndre Hopkins. I I love this move, though, for Kenyon Drake because Kenyon Drake is a guy, and I'm curious to where you guys, now that everything has settled and you've had a chance to digest it, where are you going to rank Kenyon Drake in redraft leagues right now? Because I feel like he's going to be attached to a top 10 offense. The guy proved last year he is tailor-made for this offense. He you know, he has under 500 career t- uh, carries to his frame. We're not worried about him breaking down. I have him ranked as my number nine running back right now, and I could make a case to move him up to number eight above Aaron Jones. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love this for Kenyon Drake. I mean, I, I'm i with you, Tags. I think that he's an RB1. I think he, you can't put him outside the top 12. And for all the reasons that you stated, as well as it, it, for all the worries about this offensive line last year, we saw that Kingsbury and the O-line did a great job of getting all their running backs in space. They were top 10 and second level in open field yards. And Arizona was super unlucky in the touchdown department. I mean, despite being 14th in red zone attempts per game, they were 29th in touchdowns scored when they got into the red zone. So if we're thinking they're going to get into the red zone, 
if we think they run faster, the offensive line is going to be good, if not better, because in a lot of mocks, if you're looking around, they're they're mocked to be taking and adding a, a tackle or some piece to that offensive line. So right. it's wheels up for Kenyon Drake. Yeah, Yates, are you telling me that you wouldn't take like so like Kenyon Drake? Would you take him over Leonard Fournette, who's tied to a a, a bad offense, right? Uh, over Nick Chubb, who suddenly has Kareem Hunt attached to his hip, limiting his upside. You know, you could talk about guys like Josh Jacobs, but he's not in nearly the offense that Kenyon Drake's going to be in. With David Johnson, how high have you moved him? Yeah, so with Kenyon Drake, I have him at RB11 currently, uh, just behind guys like Aaron Jones, Nick Chubb. But again, I think you could, the argument could be that I could move him up, you know, even above guys like Derrick Henry. Like if Derrick Henry... Um, I think we're going to see some regression from Derrick Henry or he yes. just doesn't play on under the franchise tag this year. I think there's a wide variety of outcomes. So I think once I get the opportunity to sit down and actually like do these, you know, full projections, I wouldn't be surprised if Kenny Drake is, is finishing as my RB seven in my, you mm -hmm. know, rankings. So, um, yeah, I think it, you know, you use the phrase wheels up. I think it's the same thing with, uh, it's the same thing for me with Kenny Drake. I think the sky's the limit for him. Yep, I, I just took him in a, a dynasty draft, and I think people were like thinking that he would last longer. I've moved him up in my dynasty rankings. Now, I moved him up to RB12 in dynasty, and the reason I'm unwilling to move him inside my top 10 is because it, it really is just a one-year deal right now. We've seen running backs uh, hit the open market, and they really just don't get contracts anymore. It's almost like you don't get a second four-year deal as a running back, right. and it's really crappy mm -hmm. as a running back. But knowing that Drake has a little bit less miles on his frame, I'm, I'm hoping that Arizona and Cliff Kingsbury just tie themselves to him. You know, like I, I think that they they probably might try and work out an extension here. Maybe it's a three year deal. And if it's a three year deal that Kenyon Drake lands in the Cardinals, you know, like they happen to work out this deal. I would probably move him up in Dynasty into my top eight running backs. Even if it's just a two year deal. I mean, I play Dynasty in a two year window. So if I know that he's going to be there for the next two years. Yeah. Sign me up. Yeah, I don't, I don't hate it. Uh, I mean, it's definitely uh, we definitely saw his stock increase in free agency. And, and so uh, we're. Yes, where are you where are you drafting David Johnson? Where I'm drafting David Johnson right now, I currently have him as my RB21 in uh, redraft leagues. So I'm not necessarily super excited about him. I think he's going to get the workload. Like we saw that with Carlos Hyde last year. He finished as a, uh, I think it was 12th in like rushing attempts throughout the season last year. And Carlos Hyde finished with over a thousand rushing yards. You know, like those are, that was really under the radar. But I think with David Johnson, if he does have anything left in the tank, He's going to get the work to produce. So I think I'm fine with taking him as like my RB2. I I think people are going to maybe overvalue him just based on his, you know, receiving ability. So I don't know, Tags, what do you think about that? Like with his receiving ability, does that boost him up? But Deshaun Watson typically hasn't thrown to his running backs. That's the thing is like even like during the entire time in Houston, not even just Watson under the, in that offense there uh, over the last few years, we just haven't seen the running backs heavily utilized in the passing game. So it really it made me question like what, what did they see in David Johnson that they really wanted because he's not a he's not a great guy in between the tackles. You don't have an offensive line to support him running the ball three hundred times. So I didn't really understand it, and that's because of that. I have David Johnson at twenty seven among running backs. I okay. would rather take an upside guy, uh, one that we could probably just tra tra transition to right now. In Darrell Henderson. I mean, Henderson, I don't think that he's locked into the workload necessarily that, that David Johnson is right out of the gate because Malcolm Brown's still there. They, they trusted Malcolm Brown over Henderson last year, but it is year two. They can prepare him for a bigger role in the offense. I, I think I'd just rather take the upside because David Johnson's one of those guys that he's absolutely not going to win you a league. I can't, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong because, again, drafting him as an RB3, that's not bad. I just think he's going to be fine. It's almost like Le'Veon Bell last year. He didn't win anybody their fantasy league. Um, he probably lost them their league because they took right. him in the first round. But if you would have gotten Le'Veon Bell in, say, the, the fourth round last year, you wouldn't have been completely upset with his performance. So maybe I'm, I'm a little bit too far down on someone like David Johnson. I'm just not excited about him. I think that's a fair place to be. I mean, I, from what we saw on the field last year, I don't think anyone's necessarily super excited about him. I think it's yeah. more so now looking at the opportunity that he has and saying this could amount to something. But again, it was it's. I, I think bringing up Le'Veon Bell is a very, very fair point because, or very fair comparison because that was kind of the same thing with Le'Veon Bell last year. He got the workload. It just he didn't do much with it. And there, you know, we could sit here and talk forever about the, the reasons for that, but. 
yeah, I think uh, David Johnson is go- just going to be one of those guys. He's never going to be what we saw in, what was that, 2017? You know, I just yeah, don't think he's ridiculous. ever going to be back to there. All right, guys, so the huge news that kind of shocked most of us was Tom Brady leaving the Patriots after 20 years uh, and heading to Tampa Bay to team up with Bruce Arians there. So, Tags, what's the fantasy football impact for Tampa specifically? And then I'll go to Derek. I'm going to say that Tom Brady coming there, obviously, you know, his fantasy impact, what does it do for him? It obviously helps it. I don't think that he's ever played with a, a trio of receiver, receivers that he's going to have there with Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and uh, OJ Howard. And Cameron Braid is now coming back to the team as well. So he has a stable of pass catchers. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is we've seen quarterbacks, right? Like we've seen Phillip Rivers have a good year. We've seen Matthew Stafford have a good year. But the truth of the matter is these guys are not mobile quarterbacks. And in today's fantasy world, you have to be a mobile quarterback to be trusted every single week. And so Tom Brady, to me, is like a high-end QB2, a guy that you can platoon uh, with someone else and kind of play the matchups. But as for Evans and Godwin, this moves Evans down into like wide receiver two territory for me. I... I'm not saying that Mike Evans is going to finish as a wide receiver too, but I do not want him as my wide receiver one on the team. Tom Brady doesn't take the shots down the field that Jameis Winston did. Um, You know, going through the past years, Bruce Arians has kind of adjusted his offense based on the quarterback that he's had. And so many people are talking about, oh, Arians wants a vertical quarterback and he's going to use Brady in that way because that's how he used Jameis Winston. We have to give Bruce Arians a little bit more credit than that. And if you go back to Carson Palmer uh, towards the end of his career in terms of what Bruce Arians was asking out of him. He was very competent. He didn't throw the ball as deep nearly as much uh, as Jameis Winston did last year. So Brady is more of a a get the ball out quick type of quarterback. Let's be honest. He has no mobility. That offensive line is not particularly great. I know that they've tried to, you know, stabilize it, but uh, I'm still saying it's a below average offensive line. That's what I'm going to say. So Chris Godwin's the one who sees the major bump here. Well, I don't want to say bump because he had a fantastic breakout season last year. I think he can replicate his 2019 season because of the way the Arians is using him. But unfortunately, this offense is not going to throw for 5,000 yards like Jameis Winston did last year. Which you, so you have to say someone is getting like someone is going to lose production here. And Mike Evans is the one just because Brady does not take as many shots down the field as Winston did. Yeah, that's the. It's all about expectation management, right? With Mike Evans, it's always like I'm getting a, a wide receiver one, and we saw both Evans and Godwin finish as wide receiver wide receiver ones last year or yep. in that range. So you know, like I think going into this season people are might have the expectation okay it'll be the exact same evans and godwin are going to both finish as wide receivers one wide receiver ones man i can't say that so i think but the expectation management has to be guys that is extremely rare for two wide receivers on the same team to finish in the wide receiver one range so with it was made possible last year by the fact that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers threw the ball so much, right? Like they were 630 passing attempts last year or something like that. It was a ridiculously high number. So that's how Evans and Godwin both were able to finish in that range. I do not see the Tampa Bay Buccaneers throwing 630 times with Tom Brady. Nope. I just don't see it happening. So now you have to kind of look at the type of quarterback that Tom Brady is and tags mentioned it. He's a get the ball out quick uh, quarterback. And that means that it's going to be the short, short game, which speaks to Chris Godwin out of the slot. So yeah, I think that Godwin's targets are, are pretty safe. I think he's going to end up around the same range. It's going to Evans targets are going to drop here. I expect that. So uh, Derek, what does this mean for new England though? And the guys that they have there on that roster, you know, Nikhil Harry, Julian Edelman, they, they have a hole at quarterback now. I think it all depends. It comes down to who fills that hole. I think that I'm a little bit higher on Jared Stidham considering what we saw out of him last preseason than possibly some are. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be the guy under center week one, but I think that considering that everybody's kind of, well, I don't want to say everybody, but people are kind of leaving New England left for dead, or there's a Mm -hmm. lot of like, we're all kind of like, okay, is Cam going to go there or what have you? Depending on who lands there, Julian Edelman is still going to see a boatload of targets. And yes, he's aging, and yes, he was dinged up last year, but he still played through it. As long as the guy is on the field, he could be a huge value this year because of the target share that he's going to garner. Because we saw last year, Nikhil Harry didn't even make it onto the field. I mean, they basically shelved him for the entire year, so expecting him to take a year two leap is taking a leap of faith. And what else do they have there? And without knowing the quarterback situation, I know one thing that is for sure and that Julian Edelman is going to get volume as long as he is on the field. So 
I, I don't know as far as what the, the offense looks like, looks like yet, but in terms of who I'm going to hitch my wagon to, I'm still willing to ride with Julian Edelman for one more year just based off of volume alone. It's very fair. And looking at their roster too right now, I mean, guys like uh, they signed Demir Bird, and that's pretty much <laughs> that's pretty much it outside of Julian Edelman and Nikhil Harry. So I think, yeah, if you're – if you're looking for a high volume play, uh, Julian Edmund's probably probably the way to go there. All right, guys. So Stefan Diggs puts out a tweet that says it's time for a new beginning, and this signals to the NFL that he wants out of Minnesota. The Bills hand out uh, significant compensation here for the, the wide receiver, and he now becomes an option there for Josh Allen. So, Tags, what is the impact here for Buffalo? And then I'll go to Derek for the Minnesota side. Uh, I mean. Stephon Diggs is a guy that never saw a whole lot of volume in Minnesota. I think Stephon Diggs is still truly undervalued as an NFL player. Uh, I talked about this when the trade happened. I'll say it again, is that Stephon Diggs is a top five, maybe top two NFL route runner. He's He reminds me so much of Antonio Brown in the way that Antonio Brown early in his career didn't see a whole lot of targets with Mike Wallace on the field. It was almost like Mike Wallace was the guy. And I remember when his contract situation was coming up and people mocked the Steelers for giving Antonio Brown. I don't think people remember that. People mocked the Steelers for giving Antonio Brown the contract they did, but I loved Mm -hmm. Brown. And I felt like he was someone that was like just a budding superstar. And when he got the targets, you were able to see what happened. Now going to the Bills, the issue here is that he is the alpha dog. They are going to treat him as that. They trade, you know, the assets they gave up to acquire him. They are treating him like that. But John Brown is still there. Uh, Cole Beasley is still there. A guy that saw over 100 targets last year. I'm not worried about Dawson Knox. I'm not worried about Devin Singletary in the passing game. But I am worried about the fact that this defense is really good in Buffalo, and they. Th- while they are going to slowly unleash Josh Allen as he becomes a more accurate passer, they're still not a team that, you know, we just talked about with guys like Deshaun Watson not throwing the ball 500 times last year. Josh Allen, I would say max, I, we would expect out of him is 550 pass attempts, but I don't even think that's very likely. So when you right. add in all these these guys, like maybe when John Brown leaves the team, we see Stephon Diggs get those targets that Antonio Brown got. But for now, I'm probably going to stick him in that 115 to 120 target range, which is slightly more than he got in Minnesota. And enough to make up for that the the, in a, the the less efficient quarterback play that he's going to get out of Josh Allen when compared to Kirk Cousins. So I'm just going to say that Stephon Diggs is still a fine wide receiver too to have on your fantasy team. He's not going to be there every single week for you. He's not a guy that's going to see you know nine ten targets a week uh, like someone like Mike Evans, who obviously I would take over him. Uh, but he should be a guy that is is somewhat stable. Um, and I, I highlighted that in the profile I wrote up for him because. John Brown, and I'll share this with you guys. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see it or not, but going back and looking at John Brown and looking at uh, what Cole Beasley did, John Brown posted wide receiver three type numbers 73% of the time in 2019. That ranked 11th in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Cole Beasley posted wide receiver three type numbers 60% of the time, which ranked 26th in the NFL. Again, each of them had 100 targets, which is which is good. Obviously, targets equal production most of the time. Uh, And Stephon Diggs, knowing that he's been ultra efficient, he should fit in that category too, where he's not probably not going to win you a fantasy league. But I also don't think that if he falls to you around that wide receiver, 24 to 26 range, I I'm, I'm pulling the trigger there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think for, for some fantasy lineups, you, you need those guys who are, are, you know, the boomer bust plays, right? The guys who can win you a week, but then you also need to be constructing your lineups with these guys who are more stable, the guys who, you know, what you're going to get each week. And I think Stefan Diggs could be that type of player in Buffalo with Josh Allen. Again, the offense kind of limits his overall, you know, uh, overall ceiling, but I think because of their commitment to the run, and because of the way that they built that defense up and just the offensive philosophy, but he's still going to have value um, for sure. So Derek, on the flip side of this, what does this mean for Minnesota? Adam Thielen is the guy there now, but you have some unknowns down that depth chart. I like it for Thielen. I think we see a revisiting as long as he's healthy to 2017, 2018, like about 140, 150 target at Adam Thielen. I think that it's a bump for Irv Smith. We saw him come on. He ran a lot of routes after their bye. I think that that helps. They're probably going to run a lot of 12, considering with this. Um, For me, Dalvin Cook could get a huge bump in targets here. If they don't address... Minnesota has, what, the 25th pick in the first round? 25th and 22nd now because of the, the trade. I think it's definitively possible that they take a wide receiver at that spot. If they don't... 
Cook and Thielen could be the two-headed monster this passing game. I mean, both of them could see a, a jump in targets, like Thielen back to, like I said, that 2017-2018 range. But Dalvin Cook could see his his weekly floor of targets raised considerably in this offense. And so those are the two that I'm, I'm going to be very – I was aggressive last year targeting Dalvin Cook, and I'm going to do it again this year. I know the injury concerns, but if he gets those – I mean, how many running backs are you going to say in the NFL can have a weekly floor of maybe five to seven targets possibly if they don't address a wide receiver and they just lost Trey Waynes, they just lost Mackenzie Alexander, the the secondary is not great there. So one of those picks is probably a corner. It's the question of what they do with the other pick. And then we've seen what rookie wide receivers do. It's probably better for the NFL than the actual passing offense, but I love it for Thielen and Cook. I think that their weekly floors get raised as well as their ceilings. Yeah, I mean, you you talk about the secondary there, Xavier Rhodes as well, but he was he hasn't been the type of player that was a lockdown corner for several years now. But then you also lose like some pass rush up front too. So I mean, you know, Everson Griffin, uh, Linval Joseph, like those guys are mm-hmm. gone too. The the Vikings defense is kind of looking a little suspect now. So mm-hmm. yeah, you have to wonder how that's going to play into fantasy football for next year. That could be a sneaky option where they could be you know a higher uh, passing volume offense than than in years past so all right guys so Teddy Bridgewater uh, leaves New Orleans as the backup he heads to Carolina on a three-year deal what does this mean for guys like DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel Derek what are your thoughts here I love DJ Moore I'm going to aggressively target him in every single format I possibly can because even last year at wide receiver 12 and PPR people talk about what well, it's been one year we st- he only scored four touchdowns. If we expect that to possibly increase at all, which I don't think it's going to go down, obviously, then <laughs> it, it ha- he has to rise for us. He's going to get the volume. It, last year, he worked more as an outside receiver than a slot wide receiver. With Joe Brady there, I think that if he takes on something that even is a semblance of of a Jefferson role like what they ran at LSU, and he runs into the slot more, they get him in free space, and it's yards after the catch, considering what we know about Teddy B, then I think it's, I love it for DJ Moore. I mean, the rest of the offense, I know we all have love for, for Curtis Samuel and all the hype, and I, I even pushed him out there last year. I love the talent. I just consider... Is this going to be enough a high enough passing volume offense to support how many different weapons? CMC is a lock. DJ Moore, I think, is a lock. So I think the rest of them are just going to be fighting for targets, and it's really not going to push anybody else up because I just don't think that Teddy or this offense can support more than two options at most. And those are the two options that I'm willing to sit here and tie to for 2020. So, Yeah, yeah, very fair points. Uh, Tags is... Is Ian Thomas someone who you'd consider looking at in redraft next year? I'm not opposed to it, uh, just because when you look at the roster, uh, yes, you and I have talked about this, and the fact that Carolina's roster is, especially on that defense, might be the worst in the NFL. Uh, they have so many holes, it's kind of ridiculous, and we could see a situation. It kind of reminds me of Arizona last year, right, where that team was like depleted defensively. They didn't have very much talent. We expected like an up-and-coming offense, and obviously we have Bridgewater coming in. We have McCaffrey there, DJ Moore, Curtis Samuel's young, uh, Greg Olson moving on. It's just a younger offense that they're installing, a new young offensive mind as the coordinator. So I do – I, I want to find some guys to like in this offense. I don't really like Curtis Samuel all that much. Uh, he didn't produce with really any of the quarterbacks last year. He didn't produce with, produce with Cam very much. He didn't produce with Kyle Allen, uh, and then obviously towards the end of the year with Will Greer. I, I don't believe that Teddy Bridgewater can support three fantasy relevant options. I really don't. Um, so it's like you look at DJ Moore. McCaffrey's going to get targeted. You have to target him. So then when you look at it and you say Ian Thomas or do you go Curtis Samuel, maybe it is Samuel, but I'm going to say that the only guys that I'm actually confident are McCaffrey and DJ Moore. DJ Moore is going to be absolutely fine. Uh, when Bridgewater took over in uh, New Orleans this year, he targeted Michael Thomas 33 I'm 33% of his pass attempts, which is just – ridiculous so he's he clearly locks on to the top target and that's clearly dj Moore here so we just mentioned this with minnesota where that defense um you know not necessarily being as stout as it has in years past could lead to a higher passing volume guys would we you know let's fast forward a year would we be surprised if carolina holds the number one overall pick next year i wouldn't be shocked at all i'm not gonna be shocked at all I, i've been on the the bandwagon of uh, i they need to tank for Trevor. That's what needs to happen. 
I mean, so if that is the case where, you know, they're holding the number one overall pick, you're assuming that they're not necessarily winning a ton of games and that they're going to be put in these situations where playing from behind. So, I mean, yes, I agree with both of you that I don't think Teddy Bridgewater is the guy to necessarily, you know, support multiple fantasy options in the ideal offense, right? But this offense could not, could be not ideal, right? It could be a situation where they have to be passing a lot more than they would like to. If that were the case, you know, and you guys had to include a third option in there, you know, just as that flyer, if it does play out this way, who would be the person that you would take outside of Christian McCaffrey and DJ Moore? Would it be Curtis Samuel or would it be Ian Thomas? Mm, I'm going to go Curtis Samuel just because of what we saw with Brady last year. I think that there's more to chew on there as far as from wide receivers perspective and their usage and getting them into space that... I think Curtis Samuel can be used in a different format than he was used last year, not just as a simple deep threat, but get him into space and put him as a yards after catch monster. And for tight ends, we've been wanting Ian Thomas to be a thing for a long time. And I think that his ADP is going to creep higher than I'm willing to go, considering what options are going to be around him. That's a very fair point. Tags, what about you? I mean, where do you have Curtis Samuel in your rankings right now? I have him down at wide receiver 47. Yeah, I'm gonna have to scroll. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm I got like, him. Yeah, I have him at 40 right now. He's gonna be a wide receiver four for me as well. I would rather take someone like Anthony Miller. I yeah, I would too. We'll talk about him in That's a bit. Fair. We'll talk about him in a bit for sure. Yeah. All right, so Austin Hooper guys signs a four year deal with the Cleveland Browns. Derek, what does this mean for Hooper in Cleveland and the other options there? I'm not high on Austin Hooper. I just don't think. That, I mean, basically they. For anybody that wants to talk about Austin Hooper as this inline tight end, that narrative needs to get shot down very quickly. He's a guy that played in the slot for 60% of the time last year. And if you look at other, that's the same, just so we give some context to that, that's the same amount of slot snap percentage that Julian Edelman garnered. So if we want to talk about where Austin Hooper lines up and if it's 12 personnel and and things of that nature. I, I'm just not an Austin Hooper. I, I, I was really kind of puzzled by this signing, to be honest. Yeah. Now, the the tea leaves of this that I think are interesting is because we've heard a lot of things about Stefanski. We saw what Minnesota did and, and, and how run heavy they were and they ran 12 and things of that nature. I'm curious your guys' thoughts because... The other side of this narrative, and you invest in Austin Hooper if you know what type of player, which obviously they're smart enough to know who he is and what he does, is this going to be a higher volume passing offense than we're possibly giving it credit? That's the only thing that I like that maybe gives Austin Hooper hope that I'm curious what other people think about it because I think the, the knee-jerk narrative is that Cleveland's going to run the ball. Yes, they invested in the offensive line, but the offensive line was terrible. So they had to put the money there. Is this going to be, are they going to throw the ball more than we're possibly seeing here just based off of why else do you invest in basically a slot slot wide receiver and that type of money? Uh, Stefanski. (laughs) That seems to be the reason. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what their philosophy is going to be on offense. I really don't. I mean, when you have Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, and now you're adding uh, Austin Hooper to play alongside David Njoku, it's like you have receivers out here, Mm -hmm. but then they also have two running backs that you could pound the ball down their throat. So it's like, what identity do you want? It's almost like you have so many playmakers, but there's only so many plays to go around. And Austin Hooper's fantasy value just took a major crash, if you ask me, because... I mean, in the red zone, is Austin Hooper a better receiver than David Njoku? Is he more athletic? Can he high point a ball as good as him? I don't think so. But I mean, do the Browns think so? The real thing is here is that those guys are gonna they're gonna they're gonna split targets because it seems like Njoku's not going anywhere. We haven't heard anything about him being on the trade block. The defense, there's talent on this Browns defense. Were they miscoached? Yeah. Um, can they be better? Yeah. I th- I think this team was expected to be a, a playoff team with Super Bowl aspirations, and now it's like, does the new coaching staff change that? And I really don't know the identity of this team right now. That's They're going to be drafting a left tackle uh, in the first round. That's going to happen. Like We know that Jack Conklin's going to walk in and play right tackle, but they need a left tackle because Greg Ro- Robinson's in prison somewhere. But, um, I, I mean, it's really difficult. This is one of those teams where, yes, I do believe the offense is going to be good, but, yes, there's going to be some major disappointments to it. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think so. Where you know this is this is good for the NFL team, the Browns, right? Yes. You can't you can never have enough receiving options, but for fantasy, I don't think this works out really well. I think you're going to be looking at um, you know some split targets there with Hooper and Njoku, like you said, Tag. So yeah, I think it makes sense from a, you know a GM perspective, from a team building perspective, to bring in a, you know and have a tight end duo like Hooper and Njoku. I think that's one of the you know better in the league, but as far as from a fantasy perspective, I don't think it works out super great. So, all right, guys. So let's look at the Atlanta Falcons here, Tags. The, the Falcons go out and trade a second-round pick for Hayden Hurst. And then Todd Gurley gets released by the LA Rams and almost immediately turns around and heads back to Georgia and signs with the Atlanta Falcons. So we've seen that offense support a top-tier tight end option for fantasy football. We just were talking about him. We've seen Devontae Freeman be very effective when healthy in this offense. So can Hayden Hurst become that top-tier option? And where are we ranking Todd Gurley for next year? I know that's a lot to unpack, but let's let's look at the Falcons' offense here. Yeah, Hayden Hurst is someone I like an awful lot. Uh, I've moved him up in my rankings. I have him as my tight end 11 for redraft leagues this year. He's, he's someone that I would consider alongside Jared Cook, just depending on what you're looking for. I, I believe that Hayden Hurst is going to be a better PPR option than someone like Jared Cook, as they got Emmanuel Sanders there in, in New Orleans now to eat up some of those targets over the middle of the field. He wasn't heavily targeted last year. He just scored an incredible amount of touchdowns right. based on the targets he received. So Hayden Hurst should be a lot – I mean – Again, if you were to add up the tight ends, like both Kyle Rudolph and Irv Smith Jr. last year, they didn't even amount to the targets that Austin Hooper got in Atlanta. Uh, so now Hayden Hurst, the, 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 the problem I have with people and Hayden Hurst is that just because he played behind Mark Andrews in Baltimore doesn't mean that he sucks. Mark Andrews happens to be really freaking good at football. And did yeah. Baltimore screw up by taking Hayden Hurst in the first round? Yeah, they did. Uh, and they paid for it, And but then they got a second round, pack, second round pick back in return. Obviously, the Falcons did like him during the draft process. They, they've, li they've liked what they've seen on tape, and I have too. I think Hayden Hurst is a good football player. I think that he's better than Austin Hooper. So... It is his first year in the offense. It may take him some time to grow, to learn the offense, to develop some chemistry with Matt Ryan. So may, he may not perform like Austin Hooper did last year, but long term, absolutely love this for Hayden Hurst. I do believe he's going to be a back end tight end one. Uh, if, if you want to grab him, I don't think he's going to be drafted that high. I think you're going to see guys like Goddard go over him. You're going to see Hooper go over him. You're probably going to see Jonu Smith, Ian Thomas. And then if you snag Hayden Hurst is like, you know, let's say you get him in like the 12th round of a redraft league, I think you are sitting in phenomenal shape. And it only helps that they sign Laquan Treadwell because Treadwell, if he's like the number three receiver there now, if that's like really what they're planning to do, he's not getting any targets. Todd Gurley, Atlanta does not, they're not going to give him 30 touches a game, 25 touches a game like he did in his heyday with the Rams. He's probably going to be a 16 to 18 touch per game guy. In a high-scoring offense, that's what you want. This is a better offensive line, much better offensive line than he played behind in L.A. this past year. So Gurley, to me, I believe he's a back-end RB1, and I would take Kenyon Drake over him just because there are health concerns about Gurley and his knee and how it holds up, new offense and all that. But there's really no other talent on this on this roster right now. I mean, Ito Smith? Are you worried about him? Are you worried about Brian Hill? You're not worried about those guys against Todd Gurley. So unless they draft a running back, which is really, it, it is still a possibility because they yeah. have run multiple back system there um, the entire time. Basically, like Freeman, uh, Tevin Coleman, they had Freeman, Ito Smith. Uh, I think they do want a multi-back system, so it's still possible that they draft a running back. But um, Gurley, hot at worst, a high-end RB2. Yeah. Yeah, Derek, what are your thoughts there with, uh, with Todd Gurley really quick? Uh, first, I, w I want to lead off with the fact of thank you, Tags. Thank you for giving Hayden Hurst some love because, yeah. good <laughs> gosh, it's so deserved. Yeah. People want to hate on him for the name, and I don't understand it because they're not looking at the production last year at all. So they get that out of the way. But as far as Todd Gurley, this was the best case scenario that anybody could have asked for for Todd Gurley and his fantasy value to even have a heartbeat for this year. And people want to talk about, well, Dirk Cutter loves to throw the ball. Yes, in recent seasons, but you have to get some context to that. He also has a history of running the ball a ton. In five of his 13 years as a head coach or OC, they've been top eight in rushing attempts, his offenses. This offensive line, like Tags talked about, is going to be so much better than the Rams. If we think that this offense is good, which I am firmly on board with because I will aggressively target. We're not even talking about Calvin Ridley, but I got to get him up in here. 
every single place that I possibly can. I think this offense is going to be fantastic. This was the jolt that Ty Gurley needed to have any type of relevance for 2020. Now, could they still take a running back? Yes, I think that that's a definitive possibility, especially in the third round. Like, I keep seeing, like, I thought that Cam Akers was going to be a great drop to them in the third round. Do they address it that early, considering they just gave up their second? I know they got two. Maybe not, but I I think they could still add somebody there because it's only a one-year deal, and right. they brought Gurley in to be the guy. So I don't think that hurts him for 2020, but it could help uh, as far as dynasty value of that running back. If he ends up in Atlanta, I'll still probably be targeting whoever gets there. He'll probably just come at a cheaper price. Yeah, so let's talk about the flip side of that signing. So we saw the Rams move on from from Gurley, right, and after a year and a half uh, or a year and a half after you know giving him that contract extension they take on a ton of dead cap I really have no idea what the Rams are doing from a team building perspective but so what let's talk about the fantasy football impact though what does Gurley's absence mean for the Rams offense tags you know Henderson Daryl Henderson there drafted in the third round last year Malcolm Brown what what are you projecting here for this this offense I believe that Darrell Henderson is going to move slowly into that role that Gurley played last year uh, at the start of the year. I don't think it's going to be – because as you saw the year go on, they went back to that one-back system and they wanted Gurley in there, and he started actually to play better. So I think it was more about getting into a rhythm with him, but they're not going to trust Henderson right out of the gate. Uh, it's kind of like a John Kelly situation, uh, but uh, obviously a more talented running back and a bigger running back at that. But everybody wa- was waiting for Gurley to move on and or, or to, to, to not play because of his knee, and they were like, oh, John Kelly – they drafted him and I'm like the equity I mean spending a sixth round pick on a running back I think that's what it was for Kelly it never signified that they were trusting him with a role uh, like that and then you know people they they tried to stand up for Darrell Henderson when they said well they drafted him in the third round well they also made sure that they matched an offer that the Lions put out there for Malcolm Brown so they clearly valued Malcolm Brown so it's like we have to see what they do here they only have what do they have four draft picks the entire draft Mm-hmm. Yeah, something so, like that. Ridiculous. Yeah, and a lot of holes in that team too. So I don't know. Like some people have said, I think they're going to draft a running back. I don't think they have the draft equity to do it. No, I think they would no. like to. Um, and we could see them sign one of these running backs that's sitting out there in the free agent market, just like a filler. Uh, but Darrell Henderson, if they don't sign a running back, this is huge for Henderson because Malcolm Brown has never been the guy that they're going to trust to hold up to 20 touches. He's not a real force in the passing game. And if you're going to move on from Brandon Cooks, like they've talked about. Uh, you know, then they're going to need another receiver to kind of make up for those targets. So Darrell Henderson is someone that right now, like let's pretend that the Rams don't add anybody in free agency. They don't add anybody of significance in the draft. Maybe like a, a sixth, seventh round pick is like a pass catcher. If that happens, I think it's, it's a risk reward pick, right? And you would pick him. I would say right in the range of someone like Ronald Jones, whereas Ronald Jones is someone that's, that sure. he does have a workload right now. We know what his workload is. We're hoping that it grows even more. Whereas someone like Darrell Henderson is you're, you're drafting on, on a potential. You understand that it could be a very bust pick, but worst case scenario, he's a guy that's going to see eight to 12 touches per game. And that could be like an Austin Eckler type producer, you know, not, not 2019 Austin Eckler, right, but right. in years past Eckler, Chris Thompson, those guys were able to be used in a flex spot. So I think getting Henderson is like an RB three. That's where I'd value him right now. Yeah. And we've seen, I mean, they need a running back for that system right it's it's predicated upon the play action and taking that pressure off of Jared Goff and they loved featuring Gurley you know two years ago where uh, what was it 18 touchdowns something ridiculous like that you know like they they gave him work so if Henderson can be that guy which I loved him coming out of Memphis uh, I think he can be a value in uh, in fantasy football next year if they don't add anyone else of course all right guys let's take a quick break here to let Tags and Derek catch their breath I want to let our listeners know that they can actually watch this episode and all of our other NFL podcasts like the Mock Draft episode we did last week with Danny Kelly on YouTube. Head over to youtube.com slash fantasy pros and hit the subscribe button there to make sure that you don't miss an episode. All right, guys, moving on here. Melvin Gordon signs a two-year deal with the Denver Broncos. Kind of a surprise fit here. Uh, but Tags, what does this mean for Gordon and subsequently the other players in that backfield? Uh, it means gross. I mean... We heard that they were going to move more towards a one-back system in 2020. And I, I was like, okay, I'm on board with that. I could see Philip Lindsay getting a bigger role because he's done fantastic when he's been given the ball. I don't I don't know why they felt the need to go out and do this. Is basically what it comes down to. But the fact of the matter is, for us fantasy players, they did do it. And we have to account for that. And when you, when you give a veteran running back like Melvin Gordon a two-year deal, he's your number one. 
And yep. if anything, this signified the death of Royce Freeman. And not that he wasn't somewhat dead already, but he was a guy that people were drafting is like a, a back end RB three flex player, hoping that maybe something would happen to Philip Lindsay and then they would have to go to Freeman. But this clearly states that the Broncos have no interest in, in Freeman right now. So maybe he's traded. I think that the the Bears are a team that actually kind of makes some sense. Uh, so you get another because they have no depth there and he would cost probably next to nothing with what the Broncos just did. Uh, but Philip Lindsay, people are going to leave him for dead. I'm not. I'm not one that's going to do that because I believe he is a player in this league. He's shown it. He's rushed for over 1,000 yards in back-to-back seasons behind a, let's say, less than stellar offensive line with bad quarterback play. If that team starts to get better, that defense is built to win. Uh, and Vic Fangio there, he's building something. Like They've yep. gotten a lot of deals on players this offseason, and I do believe that defense is going to be really strong. And if it is strong, they're going to be able to run the ball a ton. So we could see Philip Lindsay kind of play – in in that territory of someone like a Tariq Cohen, where he's, he's maybe getting, we'll say 10 to 12 touches per game. And that can be a flex type play. And if something were to happen to Melvin Gordon, obviously you move him up, but Melvin Gordon, I've, I've put him up there alongside guys like Miles Sanders, carry on Johnson, uh, leaders of their timeshares and guys that I would expect to still be in somewhat of a timeshare, but at the same time, he's an RB two. Uh, Philip Lindsay moves down into, I have Philip Lindsay as my RB 30 right now. So he's kind of like that middle of the road RB three flex yep. type player. Yeah. It's a fun offense, man. Drew Locke, Cortland Sutton, <laughs> Noah Fant, now Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay. I, they're building something there that I really, really like. All right, Derek, Philip Rivers signs a one-year deal with the Indianapolis Colts. So what does this mean for the receiving options there in Indianapolis? I think all the Colts are going to be massive values. I think T.Y. Hilton, considering the injury last year, people left him for dead whenever Jacoby Brissett was under center. But then we saw him basically pull the John Brown of Indy in the sense that he wasn't having these massive splash weeks. Yeah, he had more touchdown equity, and that's what he lived off of. But if Phillip Rivers is going to be chucking the ball, which we know Phillip Rivers is going to do, there's not a lot of people that are talking about how much they love the Colts right now. Like, I think that there's going to be great value that if T.Y. Hilton has one more year just left in his legs, that if he can still get off the line, which I think that he can, as long as he's healthy, I think he's going to be a great value. Jack Doyle is probably going to have streamer weeks where you're going to love him as well. The guy that I love the most out of all of this, just because Phillip Rivers, if, if he improves this offense, which if you look at all the completion percentages efficiency metrics yes he is an improvement from Jacoby Brissett so let's just get that out of the way the touchdown equity is going to go up there is a path to Marlon Mack being the cheaper Derrick Henry this year there is a path to Marlon Mack finishing with 12 to 15 touchdowns that is definitive because he's still running behind a top 10 offensive line Mm mm-hmm and people do not like Marlon Mack, and I don't really understand it. They, they, they hate on him because he doesn't have a pass game role. He's going to be so cheap because nobody likes him. And he's a guy with touchdown equity that could be, he could be close to an RB1 this year. I mean, what do y'all think, guys? I like it. I would 100% agree with you on Mac. It makes a lot of sense. I think the concern I have with Mac isn't so much production when on the field. It's more about staying on the field. Uh, he hasn't shown the ability to stay on the field throughout a workhorse role. Fair. But the thing is, we're hearing a lot of people talk about Naheem Hines. Is he this year's Austin Eckler? No, he's not. Um, because Austin Eckler was actually on the field for the Chargers. Uh, Naheem Hines hasn't been on the field. Like, they don't want him in a bigger role. We had so many injuries that were... They had Jonathan Williams out there instead of Naheem Hines last year. So, uh, it kind of goes to show you how they feel about him. T.Y. Hilton, I, I do like the call, and I think that Rivers is the guy to take more shots down the field, and he's going to do that. So, Hilton's value will be there. But the thing is, here's the real part that I, that I like a lot, is that... Paris Campbell is going to be extremely undervalued. And I say this because T.Y. Hilton has only played in the slot 28% each of the last two years under Frank Reich. So clearly, he's not their slot guy. He's kind of just mixed in from time to time into the slot. Chester Rogers is gone. Paris Campbell was a second-round pick. They absolutely love this kid. And Phillip Rivers has always loved those targets over the middle of the field, whether it be his tight ends or slot receivers. Go from Antonio Gates to Kendall Wright to Keenan Allen to Hunter Henry. All these guys, he loves those guys. Zach Pascal's not that guy. So I think Paris Campbell has the ability, like he's a guy that you could watch for like a potential breakout this year. Tags to your point too. I think Paris got a big bump because I was worried about him actually going into this. Did they did they address 
wide receiver with their first round pick with them trading that to San Francisco. Yeah. I think that's submitted that that's all we needed to see for Paris Campbell to be a huge value. Yep. Very, very fair point. All right, guys. So Emmanuel Sanders signs a two year deal with the new Orleans saints. I actually really like this signing for new Orleans, the team, but mm-hmm. tags, what does this mean for fantasy football in is Sanders someone worth taking in redraft leagues? Yeah, I mean, he's in that area with someone like Curtis Samuel, Uh, maybe a little bit less upside than Samuel, but kind of like a wide receiver four, wide receiver five type that you want to use for bye weeks is how I feel about Emmanuel Sanders. I mean, looking at this offense last year, even with Drew Brees, Drew Brees was playing fantastic last year. Michael Thomas is the guy, right? Yeah. We have some natural touchdown progression going to have to to come to Alvin Kamara. Kamara didn't score nearly as much as he should have last year, and we know over the course of his career at this point, he's going to score touchdowns in that offense. They always do. Uh, Brees is another year older talked about retirement he's not going to support two steady wide receivers every single week so you want to kind of try and find those weeks where they're going to be playing in a shootout maybe they're playing against the falcons who all of a sudden have zero cornerbacks in their roster um those are the ones inside of a dome you're going to want to play guys like emmanuel sanders because you're going to see breeze drop back and throw the ball 40 times but that's not going to be a uh, a very a thing that's going to happen very often because the Saints are a very very well rounded team. That defense is really good. They've only added to the back end of it. Um, the the Saints are my NFC choice. I can tell you right now they're they're going to be my choice for the NFC championship. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, make it to the Super Bowl uh, from the NFC side. I will choose them over Tampa Bay any day right now. They're they're a more complete team, and I do believe Breeze is a better quarterback at this stage in his career than Tom Brady is. So I will go ahead and say that the Saints are my NFC championships champions this year. I, love I like it. it. Yep. I like I, it. All right. Go ahead. I love Sanders. I think that the signing's fantastic because he still has juice. If you look at last year, he won on the outside. That's exactly what he did. I mean, his best metrics came versus man and press. And if you can get off and your best numbers are versus man and press, that's all I need to see. I know you still have legs. I know you could still run. And this team is going to throw the ball. Why else? I mean, they have to know that like this gives them an extra edge. Like Besides teams game planning to say okay if we take michael thomas and alvin kamara away what else are you going to hit us with consistently that we have to stop what other equations do we have to solve this absolutely firmly plants jared cook's fantasy value in the dirt though he i will not touch him in any single league at all i think that sanders squashes him hard 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 that's fair Yeah, it's very fair. All right, guys, we got a couple more that we need to get through here. So Eric Ebron signs a two-year deal with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and hats off to Tags for predicting this signing, man. Uh, But Derek, what do we do with Ebron in Pittsburgh, and what does this mean for other guys, the other guys on that roster? (laughs) I, 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 I'm not a huge Ebron guy. What they ask him to do in that offense, I I think that we could see targets spread around there. I actually, I think that Deontay Johnson is an emerging player. He had a very quietly sneaky good rookie season. I think that he is easily the number two option in this passing offense, and it's not Ebron. I think this was just a value signing. I think that he's going to have his weeks. Like, if they're in a really good matchup, I'm more worried about Ebron... For DFS purposes, I will not have any exposure probably anywhere else outside of that. Sure. Tags, Vance McDonald, does this mean that you can just cut him in, in Dynasty Leagues? Uh, Yeah. I I mean, people were talking about Vance McDonald being the starting tight end. I'm like, I don't see any way that they're going to move forward with McDonald. I, yeah, there's a lot of other tight ends that have a chance to ascend up depth charts, and I just feel like this is the end of the road for him. I, I know he's – did he sign like a – was it a two-year extension or something like that where he's going to be on their team for two more years? When they but, just restructured him too. Yeah, whatever the case is with him, it made zero sense. And, um, well, I mean, they're going to pay for that. But, yeah, Vance right. McDonald is – no, no. Yep, for sure. All right, last one that I wanted to spend some time here, guys, is Nick Foles is traded to the Chicago Bears for a fourth-round pick. So what does this mean for Chicago tags from a fantasy football perspective? Is he going to be the starter there? And what does this mean for guys like Allen Robinson and Anthony Miller? Uh, I don't know if he's going to be the starter. I think that Ryan Pace still wants Trubisky to be the starter. Uh, I mean... (sighs) It's going to be an open competition. I don't think there's any way around that, but I think they want Trubisky to win the the starting job. If 
Nick Foles were to win that job, I do believe it does help so, someone like um, like Anthony Miller, who plays in the slot a lot. And we saw uh, Nelson Aguilar see a bump in targets once um, Nick Foles took over. So it's it's a whole lot of speculation at this point with the Bears. I, I don't see any way that they stop targeting Allen Robinson as much as you know they have uh, to this point. But Anthony Miller is a guy that I could see taking a big step forward if, you know, Matt Nagy actually puts him on the field because it took about half of a season for Nagy to put Anthony Miller on the field in a full-time role last year. And once once that did happen, we started to see production. But with Taylor Gabriel gone, it opens a whole – I don't think people realize just how big of a part – or a share of the pie, I should say, that Taylor Gabriel was seeing with the Bears under Matt Nagy. So him leaving – it's going to open up, you know, over five targets per game. So Anthony Miller is a, is a definite breakout candidate, and Nick Foles, his skill set matches much better in terms of what he does uh, in the intermediate areas of the field because Nick Foles is not a great deep passer. Yeah, I really like Anthony Miller. I think he can be a great value. Uh, it's just going to be, you know, is it going to be Foles that's going to be the starter there? So it's just something to monitor as we go throughout the summer. Mm-hmm. All right, so Derek, the other side of this, this means that Gardner Minshew is the starter in Jacksonville now. Is this good news for guys like DJ Chark and D.D. Westbrook? I love Gardner Minshew. I think that he showed last year that he can definitively play in this league. I think that it's good for for all the weapons around there. Well, I say all the weapons. I think that it's good for Chark. We know who the number one is there definitively. I think that it could hurt Leonard Fournette. We saw his target share take a hit whenever Minshew was under center because we've seen the mobile quarterback. That happens every single time with running backs. But his target share went from 21% to 15%. So if anybody's looking for Leonard Fournette to repeat this high, heavy target share that he did last year, I'm not one that's going to say that's going to happen, especially with Gruden in town now. Yeah, very fair point. All right, guys, I think that's all the news. Did I miss anything? No, outside of the fact that Ben Roethlisberger needs to shave. That is very true. <laughs> yeah. That is very, very true. I Looking at his video the other day, if a little bird popped up out of his beard, and uh, I, would, I wouldn't I would have been surprised. Well, I mean, I just think about it. I mean, like, he woke up, he looked in the mirror, and said, yep, this is the way I want to present myself to the social media <laughs> Good to world go. today. Good to go. I, I don't get it. <laughs> All right. Well, great job, fellas. Uh, Derek, thanks so much for jumping on this episode with us, man. Appreciated your insight here. Hey, thank y'all for having me. This was a lot of fun. We, I think we ran through a ton of players considering the time. And really, uh, I really appreciate y'all having me chop it up. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. And, hey, guys, reminder to follow Derek on Twitter at dbro underscore FFB. And you can find both Mike and I on Twitter as well at KyleYNFL and at Mike Taglier NFL. A huge thank you to Pristine Auction again for sponsoring the podcast. Pristine Auction is my go-to for filling out my office with amazing signed jerseys, and I highly recommend checking their stuff out at pristineauction.com. This was a crazy packed episode, but it's time for us to get out of here. For Mike Taglier and Derek Brown, I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.